Okay, so good morning, everyone, and I'm very glad uh, and oh, honored to be here and uh, speak to so many of you here. Uh, so, indeed, uh, no, I represent indeed Poznan University of Technology and also a Center for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, or CAMIL. And uh, yeah, we are, I, I think, the primary provider of IT workforce for this region. And also, recently, I probably should advertise a bit. Uh, we are the first, actually, I think, uh, throughout the country, the first uh, department of computing science or faculty of computing who actually opened artificial intelligence as a course of study, starting from the undergraduate studies. So uh, in, a, in a sense, that's also part of why I'm here. Yeah? So in my talk, I will try to somehow take you through a few ideas and a few impressions that somehow show or demonstrate how, indeed, programming may change in the future and uh, how it's particular uh, AI and machine learning may impact the way we develop software. Uh, so I would say from the observation that in a sense what brought us all here is one thing, or more or less one, I would say, that software complexity. Yeah? Uh, it's really very hard to underestimate how long way we went through for that, the last, like, I would say, 50 years, uh, for starting from actually, you know, programs that were just simple functions or procedures to actually writing entire, you know, huge um, you know, uh, software artifacts for which actually it's now quite common to reach numbers of line codes like in the hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of code. So what we see here is a you know, simple visualization showing you a couple of famous, uh, you know, software projects and the number of lines of code they actually count. And, you know, that complexity raises all sorts of challenges. And I would say more or less that software, software engineering is technically the domain, the branch of computing, computer science that is trying to address that complexity with, with different ways or in different means. Uh, so as an emanation of that, what we observed in you know, recent decades is a growth of all range of different software development methodologies. And most of you are probably much more familiar with them than me. And um, yeah, so there's, there's that famous church of Agile. Yeah, we have the order of DevOps yeah? and the divine convent of Scrum. Uh, and of course, all those you know, churches or denominations you know, fight with each other and you know, present different takes on how you should work with software and develop it. And also, they come up with all sorts of weird, I would say, logos that strangely, all of them actually resemble more or less some, strange, some, some, some arrows that follow uh, each after another. You know, uh, the, our opinions about software engineering may vary, and some scientists, for instance, on the more academic side are very critical about software engineering. The most critical of them was probably the famous uh, Edgar Dijkstra, uh, you know, the author of uh, too many graph traversing and graph, actually, in general, algorithms, but in particular, graph algorithms. Uh, that, that, that is actually hard to count them. Uh, and he famously stated that, you know, in, in his eyes, software engineering is a science or the, or the methodology of how to program if you can't program. Yeah? Uh, but of course, he was very, too harsh and very harsh. And he said that like you know, 40 or 30 years ago. And uh, I would definitely agree that uh, today, to nowadays, things had, had changed dramatically. And I think software the, you know, engineering is really very good at helping us at different aspects of uh, software development. And um, yes, yeah, so, so uh, I, 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 I'm not agreeing with them. But on the other hand, uh, what I'm talking about is not a classical software engineering. Or I would say it's, it's, a, it's about techniques that would have a chance of actually changing or transforming software engineering in quite a revolutionary way, I would say. So I'll, I'll be taking you elsewhere, hence this slide. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and that elsewhere means, you know, using all sorts of tools and uh, techniques, algorithms, approaches that popped up in recent, in the recent decade, decade in AI and machine learning in particular. And I think there's not a single person in this audience that is not you know, somehow familiar with that or is not aware of what is happening because we see all those development, developments actually occurring everywhere. Uh, so we have uh, excellent machine learning algorithms that uh, excel at uh, playing all sorts of games uh, and actually surpassing humans at those capabilities. Uh, we have uh, deep net net networks and other models that are, that are very good at, for instance, uh, controlling uh, 
locomotion, as in the right hand examples, of course, with some exceptions, like you, as you can see. Uh, both these examples are actually have been produced by DeepMind, the leading you know, company in the field on, on the verge between computer science and AI, in particular machine learning. So this is happening. We can see it everywhere. We, we, we talk about deep fakes. We, we see how amazing those systems are at generating you know, different all sorts of artifacts, of course, with, with a different uh, degree of accuracy or actually uh, faithfulness. Uh, but this is still exciting. Uh, but we, I think uh, maybe we keep forgetting that this can be used also in our context when we do programming, when we actually develop software. And this is exactly what I'm here for. So my, my tenet of this talk would be that AI and machine learning are now mature enough to effectively aid software development. And I would say even more, possibly even revolutionize that. And I will try to convince you about that. So uh, and I will start probably from, from the top most, I would say, stance or approach that you can imagine when you talk about applying machine learning and AI in, for, for software development, which would be program synthesis. Uh, program synthesis is very far-fetched and very ambitious in saying, let's try to automate the process of software, or, or actually of code generation, where in a nutshell, this can be demonstrated in this, this sort of diagram. Uh, if we have a user, that user is producing certain intent about a piece of software, and we would like, based on that intent, produce that piece of software and, you know, in a way that makes that piece of software comply with that intent. And of course, it's a quite concrete statement, but on the other hand, it has many different incarnations, many different variants. So for instance, you may ask actually, who is the user? Uh, the user can be a professional programmer, an experience in a given programming language, but there could be also a system analyst or maybe even end user. I will, I will be actually talking about end user programming quite a lot in this talk. Uh, then. The central question, actually, is how do you express the intent? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably the hardest thing in program synthesis. How to, how, what should we make available to the user so that he or she can conveniently express what he or she means by the program? Yeah? And then, given that intent, there's lots of ways uh, how this can be translated into something execu executable, meaning you can think about different programming languages, uh, either professional or, or like the business prof programming languages like Java, I don't know, Scala, C++, whatever, or domain-specific languages, or even other executable structures, some hardware structures, for instance. Uh, then you can talk about different ways, you know, different orders of scale. You, we may talk about synthesizing just code snippets, or maybe entire functions or methods, or maybe even entire objects or modules or packages. You know, of course, depending on this, this will be more or less difficult. So uh, to, to start, you know, to, to make you more aware of what I'm talking about, let's ask how many of you have actually heard about uh, the flash fill feature in Microsoft Excel? Probably, yeah, a few of you. So that's a feature that actually allows you to complete a uh, certain task, which consists in extracting or transforming strings into something that you need yeah, in, in, in brief. So for instance, this may mean you have an, a table of uh, uh, names and uh, countries like this, and you would like to build a formula that actually extract the name of the country from that. Yeah? Or uh, you have a slightly more difficult example, like a couple of columns that form the address, and you would like to concatenate those elements uh, using some commas in between to produce, uh, to produce a more or less complete address. Mm -hmm. Or even more, a sophisticated example would be uh, first name, last name, and email hosting, and the task is actually to produce an uh, email address at that particular host, uh, host service. So, uh, what uh, Flashfield enables you is actually, uh, uh, given this input data, you can start typing uh, the desired output, the desired outcome of the computation in the, this cell, and uh, Flashfield will try to give you possible solution to your problem. And so what you see here in gray is actually what, uh, uh, what the, uh, the Flashfield's hypothesis is, is about, what, is, what your intent is. So as you can see on all these three examples, this is actually, uh, Flashfield is capable of guessing users' intents correctly. And actually, you may believe me or not, but under the hood, this is exactly program synthesis. 
I happened to listen to the talk of Samit Gulwani of Microsoft Research from Redmond. And he explained that quite in detail, that there's basically a separate uh, domain-specific language under the hood that actually is prepared to uh, do uh, string transformations. And there's a specific, specific heuristics uh, trained there and parameterized in a very sophisticated way. So it guesses your intents just based on a handful of examples, typically just one example, two examples, and so on. So of course, for the end user, it doesn't look like program synthesis, but indeed it is. And this is a very, I think, nice and very practical example of how program synthesis may change uh, you know, the way we program and how we can use it to actually reach out to end users, yeah? which is maybe have, of course, uh, immense impact. So Flashflow is basically a, a form of synthesis from examples. And that's arguably, I would say, the most popular approach to, to program synthesis. So in a sense, what we do here, in this case, we traverse the space of programs in search of a program that passes all examples, which are basically examples are nothing else than tests, yeah? meaning like input-output pairs that tell you, to actually tell you, that express how that program or function or method should behave for a given out input. Uh, what we've been, for instance, doing in my team and many people all over the world in the last 20, 30 years is use metaheuristic algorithms, in particular evolutionary algorithms, to solve this problem. But the idea is that we have a population of initially random programs and we basically main maintain a simulated evolution in that population. We breed those programs, we cross them over, we mutate them using certain rules, certain search operators. And each time we produce a new program, that program is sent to evaluation using certain fitness functions. That fitness function would typically count how many tests my program passes uh, on a, for a given task. And of course, we do it in the hope of reaching at some point a program that will pass all tests. That doesn't have to happen, of course, because we talk about inexact algorithm. But actually, there are also exact algorithms for synthesis from examples. Uh, so, it, broadly speaking, you can divide all algorithms that can solve this problem into exact and inexact or heuristic, and, uh, and but they, you know, they, they are applicable different, uh, in different settings. The main challenge we have to cope with here is actually that the search space of those programs is really huge. Yeah? We're talking about combinatorial explosion here. It's, uh, it's enough to allow your programs to have, I don't know, like 10 instructions, uh, where the vocabulary of instructions is in the order of a dozen or something like that. And already you are talking about, you know, the search space that counts like billions of programs. Yeah? Uh, so that's a, that's a main challenge here. So that's, but of course, that's just one approach uh, of how uh, we can express intent. So examples and tests are, um, are actually uh, one way of expressing intent. We can be, in a sense, more ambitious, and some of you may have heard that technically we can also try to synthesize programs from formal specifications. Because sometimes we can indeed uh, tell formally, say formally, what I would like my program to do. Yeah? And what you see here in this slide is a formal uh, 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 statement that uh, defines the desired behavior of a function that cal calculates the ma a maximum of two numbers. So it's a no, Lisp-like notation, so it should be more or less familiar to, for, for, for you. Um, and uh, notice that this formulation is not a program. This is not a program. This is a set of logical clauses that can be verified or can be, can be tested, can be queried, but actually, uh, but technically speaking, this is not a program. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, systems uh, uh, that actually, in response to this sort of specification, can synthesize programs like this one, which is a correct you know, response to the specification. And this is uh, typically done in quite a sophisticated way. In brief, what is, being, uh, what is going on here is conversion of that task into a satisfiability problem and using so-called SAT solvers or satisfiability solvers to actually uh, uh, synthesize that program. Or more specifically, we talk typically here about so-called SMT solvers, satisfiability modular theory SAT solvers. But you, as you, many of you know, SAT solvers are you know, very common tools in formal verification in any other context, and there are very good implementations out there that you can use, and that's exactly one of the use cases here. Uh, what the logo you can see in the lower uh, right hand uh, of this uh, slide is actually the logo of a contest that is run every year uh, at one of the scientific conferences, which is exactly addressing this type of tasks. We have a range of benchmarks, 
uh, where the specification is given formally, as in this example, and the task of different teams is to try to come up with algorithms that produce correct programs like this one, uh, possibly in a possibly efficient, efficient way. Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, and uh, you may try it for yourself. Uh, so what you see here is Leon. Leon is a software actually made freely available by EPFL in Switzerland, where uh, it's actually a fully capable program, system, for, system for program synthesis, uh, more specifically program synthesis in Scala. Um, so what you see here is uh, uh, basically mostly helper function for defining the problem of synthesizing a function that deletes an element from a sorted list. And you can actually, I think, see it more or less, more or less clearly in the bottom slide. So actually, the, form, the formal statement here is that the content, content of the output list should be the same as the content of the input list minus the element that should be removed. Yeah? That's one condition, or that one part of the formal specification, and the other part is that the, the, the resulting list should be still sorted. And given that, uh, uh, you, can, you can launch, uh, uh, launch uh, uh, Leon, and in a couple of uh, seconds, minutes, hours, years, <laughs> it should produce an answer for you. Yeah, typically, of course, if your, 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 your um, specification is not too complex, uh, you will get an answer within seconds or within maybe a few dozens of seconds. And you, we, sh we should arrive at it in a moment, yeah. yeah patience, patience, yeah. I just want you to see for yourself that this is happening, of course, and uh, all of you can actually go and visit that, uh, that website, Leon, EPFL, CH, and see for yourself. And you see that this is the synthesized program that actually, if you look closely, is exactly doing what it should do, meaning it is recursively traversing that list and actually locating or testing in each iteration whether the head of the list is greater than, uh, than uh, something returned from the tail of the list. So, so far, so good. Uh, a very interesting, or at least I, I think for me interesting side note for this, that is that what is extremely helpful in this search, which I mentioned is, is taking place in a huge space of programs, is that the data types actually are extremely helpful at constraining the search space. And um, there's a very nice example given by Philip Wadler, one of the co-authors of Haskell and a very fam famous figure in the field of functional programming, who, who actually gave that very nice example uh, saying, Imagine you would like to synthesize or write a function that given a list of arbitrary elements, so you don't care about the type of the elements, is supposed to produce a natural number. So first of all, it doesn't sound like specification yeah, because it's so broad. Yeah? You don't say anything about what the function should return. But actually you can show mathematically, formally, that the only function that meets this specification is a function that returns the length of that list. Because if, you know, even intuitively speaking, if you don't care about the type of the elements, so you, it, the list can contain anything, that the only natural number that you can somehow infer from that list is something related to the length of the list. Uh, so, of course, I'm not giving the formal proof here, but this is sort of intuition that, uh, that tells you that um, indeed uh, there's something uh, interesting here and data types are actually a very, very, fundamental, very interesting area of research uh, when it comes to program synthesis. So if you, if you listen to me like, you know, carefully in the last 20 minutes, uh, so a lot of what we are talking about here is about program correctness. Yeah? It's about uh, uh, actually telling or deciding whether my program is correct or not. Yeah? And of course, either by testing it on different examples or by uh, subjecting it to, to or, or trying to synthesize it from specification. So that uh, I think many of you uh, can relate to because actually this is very closely related to program verification. Where again, we use those tools I mentioned before like SAT solvers or SMC solvers to verify correctness of programs. And of course we can talk about software but even more commonly this is being done for hardware. And you may be aware that there are actually entire tool chains right now of uh, provably correct tools that can be loose, used for I don't know, program uh, compilation, of course, debugging, linking, and so on. And uh, this is quite obvious that for software critical systems, that's that's something that we have to use to make sure that our software is is correct. 
Uh, and again, that Lyon I've mentioned uh, before is actually capable also of that. So uh, uh, exactly the same interface uh, available online can, <clears throat> can be used to verify programs. So this is, an, again, a piece of Scala, Scala code. And there's the uh, definition of the, uh, the func maximum function which calculates the maximum value in a list. Yeah? And this is a correct uh, implementation of the maximum list, uh, maximum uh, function in this sense. What I'm doing here right now is messing up with this function by reverting the sign of this, uh, of this comparison so that the function becomes incorrect. And then um, I can click uh, the verify uh, button. Or, okay. And in a moment, you will see that uh, Leon comes up with the answer that this function is incorrect with respect to the specification that requests it to return the maximum element of the list. So is that, that's exactly what you get here. But so again, that's something okay, I guess there's a definitely a substantial part of this audience for, for whom this is quite common because you probably some of you definitely use this sort of tools to verify program correctness with respect to some verification, uh, some, some specification. But what is quite interesting, and maybe not all of you maybe know about that, is that every time a verification fails, it will produce for you a witness of that failure, a so called counterexample, uh, uh, or more specifically, the input that causes your program to fail. And that's exactly what happened here. So you can see here that uh, Leon produced for me a certain input, certain list of numbers for which this function behaves incorrectly. And that's actually quite uh, useful also for synthesis. And there's actually an entire branch of program synthesis research which uh, can be characterized as counterexample driven program synthesis. And there are lots of people actually who work on that uh, worldwide. And I, I'm happy to say that actually with my team, we are also working on this. And what you see here in this slide is a specific algorithm that follows that idea. And that algorithm is again based on that evolutionary computation, or evolutionary algorithm I, I, I said about a few slides ago. So the whole concept is that we use evolutionary algorithm as a program generator, that genetic programming that I mentioned before. And the, the programs being produced by the, that genetic search are being subject to formal verification with respect to some given uh, specification. And of course, because this is an evolutionary process that starts from scratch, from a random population, then of course those programs will be initially initial incorrect. So when verified, each of those programs will produce a counterexample. What we do here is actually we take those counterexample and we collect them and we use them as, a, as tests. And, and thanks to that, we can calculate that fitness functions of, of our programs by counting how many tests they passed, where the tests are actually the counterexamples identified in the previous generations of the algorithm. And this happens to work pretty well, and I can brag a bit that we be, were able to publish that at the HKI conference, and also we got the best paper award at the Gecko conference two, two years ago. So that's also interesting for itself, and I hope that it's this part of the, this stage of my talk, you are more or less convinced that it's a lot in program synthesis about that intent. Yeah? It's about how to actually specify the user intent. So in, in the longer run, you can even think, you know, what could be the most natural way of expressing intent for humans? Yeah? Because, you know, this is a human user here, so, so we would like him or her to be comfortable when working with this sort of systems. And I guess the, the answer is obvious. What is the most common means of communication for us is a natural language. And you know, uh, if I said that we would like to use natural language for program synthesis 10 years ago, I would be at the spot taken to the mental institution right now. Yeah, but uh, believe me or not, we are actually at this, at this particular stage right now. So we, what you can see in this slide is a modular neural network we uh, designed with uh, my students, uh, which actually does exactly that. It's being trained on examples, which, each of which is a pair of natural language specification and a piece of source code. So it's always a pair, input, output. And uh, technique speaking, it's a quite complex network that uh, first does uh, more or less rudimentary uh, natural language analysis on the input side by word embedding and then squeezing arbitrary long you know, sentences, uh, embedded sentences into fixed length latent representation. And then using that latent representation, using doubly recur recurrent neural network to convert that basically into AST trees, abstract syntax syntax trees. Uh, 
So actually we have a system that given input formulated in natural language produces a piece of code uh, in, uh, in you know, of course it was abstract, abstract syntax tree but of course can be shown also linearly. So again, you know, five, ten, 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 years ago, uh, ten years ago, I would say that's completely out of question, but this really works. Uh, of course, maybe not perfect yet, but we are definitely closing to, to better and better solutions. So what you can see here is a range of small examples where on the left-hand side you have the natural language query, and on the right-hand side you have the outcome of uh, output of the system which is formulated in a yet another domain-specific language, which is a simplified version of, uh, of LISP. Uh, so uh, what we tested in this particular experiment is how shortening that natural language specification impacts the uh, accuracy of synthesis. And as you can see, actually, uh, for those four first examples, it goes pretty well. The output is still the same. And only when we shorten the specification to very terse uh, formulation, then uh, the output actually, the, the, the outcome fails. Yeah? So you may say, of course, no, this is trivial. It's a very small example. But look at that one. Yeah? For instance, that one at the bottom of this slide. Here the task is actually to synthesize a function that is supposed to take an array of numbers, or more specifically, the first half of that array of numbers, and calculate a median from that part of the array. So this is a really quite uh, sophisticated task in terms of actually being compound, yeah? because first of all, you have to extract this first half of the array. Then from that first half of the array, you have to calculate the median. And actually, calculating median in itself is a, is a compound task, because first of all, you have to sort that array, and then you have to locate the, uh, the central element of that array. And as you can, say, uh, you can see, the this, this uh, natural language specification is actually converted into something that b behaves correctly. And of course, uh, I, I should you know, s say a few caveats here, um, among others, that this is, of course, that this doesn't scale too well, meaning, is, of course, you cannot talk for, to the system for hours. Yeah, I would like to have this sort of web browser that, you know, have this, but of course, we, this, this doesn't scale to large programs, yeah, but. Uh, to me, at least, it's really impressive that we are already at this stage. And of course, I, by, by we, I don't mean specifically our team. This is you know, yet another contribution to, to this field where a couple of teams around the world are actually very hardly working on. And, but this is you know, reaching out to other domains and actually to that specific end user programming I, I've mentioned to you before. Uh, well, this is a, slide, this is a screenshot from, from a paper who just, just, I think, published just a few weeks ago. Uh, which is about con uh, converting natural language queries into SQL queries. And this is aim aimed not at uh, you know, professional programmers, but, I, but at end users, like you know, medical staff. Uh, and the database we are talking about here is not, it's not a trivial database composed just of a single table. It's a you know, the database that you know, in one table stores some you know, uh, patient data, uh, in another table possibly some types of, of treatments they have been under, you know, the, the taking under, and so on and so forth. But you can see that you know, the, the question, those questions are indeed quite sophisticated, and what the system spots out on the right-hand side is a fully-fledged SQL query that can be executed, or at least we can try to execute it and see what happens. Yeah? So again, that's really impressive to me, and I think you know, program synthesis from natural language will take off you know, very soon, especially in the end-user context. But then I should probably also add that uh, all I'm talking about, you know, this possible impact of machine learning and AI on software development doesn't, you know, is not limited only to, to program synthesis because there are other tasks, other activities you all take part in that uh, somehow can benefit from, from that. Uh, so, for instance, first of all, it's not necessarily conventional programs that can be synthesized. Uh, uh, people being, have been th synthesizing, from example, some examples, even Java bytecode. Yeah? Uh, me personally and some other guys all over the world, so we've been experimenting with synthesizing image processing pipelines, like the one on the right-hand side, where you have a, actually a, a, a block, uh, you know, diagram of image processing and image analysis operations that have, hasn't been designed by humans. This is just a, an evolutionary algorithm that after a long time of evolution produced this sort of, of pipeline that happens to do what we were supposed or we were expecting it to do. Then there's a really very successful branch of synthesis that actually concerns uh, analog circuits and digital circuits. And interestingly, in those domains, 
there are artifacts, uh, hardware artifacts, designed by this sort of synthesizers I've been talking about, that can be actually claimed being better than those de designed by humans in terms of some non-functional properties, like for instance, occupancy on the chip, for instance, how many transistors you take on the chip to realize a, I don't know, a digital multiplier, for instance. That, there's a very nice team of colleagues working on that in Brno, in the Czech Republic, for instance. Then sorting arrays, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of variability here. But the, the other thing is that it's not about only synthesis, because arguably, synthesis is the, is the most ambitious task, yeah? you know, going from intent to program. Um, you have all other you know, range of, ranges of tasks that actually where AI ML is very helpful, like bug thing, the finding, bug fixes, the duplication. What you see on the right hand side of the slide is an excerpt uh, from the uh, source code of the Zune player. Zune player, probably not too many people in this audience know what this Zune player is because it's a Zune, you know, it's an MP3 player made by Microsoft as a series of players actually. They, apparently they still make them, okay, but I don't think they are very popular on the market. Uh, but um, uh, what you can see here is the uh, excerpt of code from some early versions of Zune, uh, where, as it happens, it, well, there was a bug that caused some sort of overflow on every first uh, January, and uh, and that was of course very problematic because actually it was even freezing that that piece of hardware. Uh, so what people uh, uh, cited at the bottom of the slide and other teams in the world were, were were able to do were actually they were able to devise methods that would go through the source code, possibly really huge uh, source code base, and uh, locate those bugs. And not, not, not only, actually not only locate them, but occasionally even fix them, so, which is really, really impressive. And actually, it's not necessarily machine learning here. That's why actually the title of my talk is AI for you know, program synthesis and, and other activities, uh, because you know, actually quite many of those algorithms that I'm talking about are not necessarily have, have, haven't necessarily been trained. They have been occasionally designed by hand. Uh, so uh, in a bigger picture, so you, I, would like to, what I, I would like to maybe spend a few more minutes on is uh, AI and ML for program optimization, or more specifically, high-level program optimization improvement. And uh, I, would, I think a good, a good uh, like, you know, I would say, starting point from this, for this is that famous quote by Mark Anderson, you know, uttered a few years ago, that software is eating the world. And where, by which he meant that essentially nowadays almost every company has to become a software company because we, we cannot avoid basically digitizing many business processes and so on and so forth. I think, okay, it's all fine and dandy, but as a matter of fact, I would say, okay, but the software that is eating the world is often really badly written. Yeah? A lot of software that is being designed, produced, it's not necessarily optimal with respect to different uh, criteria. <clears throat> Especially what I'm talking about here are those non-functional uh, criteria, like uh, being, uh, you know, uh, consuming a lot of memory, having you know, uh, uh, slow response time, uh, uh, consuming too much power, for instance, in the, on the mo mobile device, and so on and so forth. So there's uh, definitely a very interesting market for high-level optimization of uh, code bases with respect to some non-functional properties. And uh, again, some part of my efforts in the past, actually, and ongoing efforts to, as well, is about um, uh, actually with my colleagues uh, from, from Poland and also from the UK, is actually devising tools for this sort of high level software optimization uh, and that, uh, that actually ad address this problem. One of those tools we, we, we produced is something we call Tiffin, which is technically a high level optimization uh, framework for virtually, I would say, every uh, programming language that is based on JVM, on Java Virtual Machine, but in particular for Java and for, for Scala. Uh, where, you know, the usage of the tool is actually very simple. Uh, the, the, the user has actually only to, to point out to the set of components that can be somehow juggled, which can, can be replaced, can be, you know, um, can be uh, uh, you know, combined into some combinatorial way and has to define an objective to, to optimize, and actually Tiffin does the rest. So to pass to an example, um, uh, assume we have a, some, some, a set of services that have alternative implementations and can be parameterized in different ways, and 
given those services, the task of the software engineer is to pick a few of them. So let's say the entire configuration of a web service uh, as a whole is optimal in terms of, I don't know, response time, memory occupation, and so on. But this may be very problematic because those individual services, they can impact each other. Yeah? Because, for instance, they can they consume the same resources, they maybe interfere with each other, and so on and so forth. And doing that, you know, configuring this sort of environment manually is very you know, time-consuming, uh, mundane, and people don't like it. So this is exactly where Tiffin can come into uh, with help. Uh, and indeed, you, you can believe me or not, but this is how you call it. You can actually ask it to minimize certain user-defined, let's say, latency function, as just a function written in Scala or, or Java, and uh, uh, actually Tiffin automatically scans your software artifact looking f and actually de derives the grammar of classes and then automatically tries to replace existing components with alter alternative components looking for the best possible solution. Interestingly, th this doesn't actually even need a source code because it works via reflection, so actually it's, it's completely independent on the software. There's no dependency at all. So we've been using that for in many contexts, and I, we have a, quite, quite, quite nice uh, success stories, a few of them summarized in this slide, where, for instance, we've been able to show that we can, using this sort of technology, we can improve access time for, for certain data structures, for instance, skip lists in particular paper we wrote. Um, we have been actually detecting violations in the hash code function in Hadoop, and uh, we found, like I think, 400 of them or something of the, uh, like, like that. Well, of course, the interesting additional task was trying to even the distribution of hash codes, which, as you know, is very critical when it comes to, of the, when it comes to efficiency of, of data structures. And also, we've been experimenting in, with using this, again, the same framework that the Tiffin to, to actually uh, optimize energy consumption of, of uh, for instance, Guava collections or some other uh, software um, um, or the data structures. So I think it's a very interesting uh, development, and uh, again, not that ambitious as program synthesis, but actually enables you to think about you know, tools that uh, take away from software developers those activities that are particularly tiring, mundane, and, 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 and I, I guess most of us would be happy to work with the most more creative stuff and delegate those, you know, that combinatorial search in the space of possible configurations of web services or whatever to some, some tool like this one. And the, the, the link here actually points to, to more material on this particular activity. So and closing you know, uh, slowly to the end, uh, I would, in a sense, like to, to, to point to or, or demonstrate to you yet another interesting development. Because uh, you know, all I've been talking about so far is uh, mostly about more or less offline interaction because user intent and some software artifacts that are being produced, for instance, in the process of synthesis. Uh, but, you know, I guess most of us, we wouldn't like to stop programming, yeah? because I guess most people in this audience actually like it. Yeah? And we would very, we'd be very happy to have tools that actually help us at this process uh, in an intelligent way, but not necessarily take away the jobs from us. Yeah? And this is also happening. And what you see in this uh, animation is something called Tab9, which, which is actually already a commercial tool that you can use. And it's a te technically, it's a plugin you can download for a Visual Studio Code and PyCharm, and, and I think a few other frameworks. And scientifically speaking, this is basically a language model trained on huge volumes of software, source, source codes more specifically. And it's actually doing simply hinting, meaning as you type, it's giving you hints what is likely actually to, to be written or desirable to be written in the next few, no, few characters or lines. And you can see it first pretty well. And actually, it of course, works not only for, for, for Python, as is in this example, but also for C++. And it's really stunning how well it performs, because actually, it, it doesn't only care about program syntax, it also cares about program semantics, which can be nicely seen in the next example. So you have here two snippets of code which differ just in one, with one, in one uh, character. So here is a, we call a method get user, and this is a method get users. So semantically speaking, is not much difference, yeah? unless you don't know the type of the returned by this, uh, by this function. There's actually no additional information. 
but look at the hints given by the system. Yeah? Uh, because of that plural used in this right-hand column, in that right-hand example, it is actually suggesting methods that would uh, do something, that would assume that uh, app is a list. Yeah? And that's why append, that's why sort, update, and so on. While here, because the name of the method is in singular, it's actually suggesting different, uh, different completions, different, uh, uh, different hints. And similarly here, this is even more striking. Yeah? We have a uh, conditional statement that where so far the programmer wrote, you know, in the true branch wrote that this, you know, the program should write yes. Yeah? And the natural, of course, for us, natural uh, you know, uh, completion of this is to actually uh, uh, write a piece of code that will actually produce the string no. And similarly, in the right-hand example, is strong and weak. So I find it really fascinating, I would say, in many layers, and I'm really puzzled and thrilled by the breadth of those usage scenarios, meaning it's not only fascinating how far those systems have, have went, but also how many, I would say, areas of software development uh, this is actually affecting and will probably affect even more. So I hope that I managed to convince you somehow that AI and ML are now mature enough to revolutionize software development, not only transforming, but probably even revolutionize, and definitely we should be readying ourselves for that, whether we like it or not. And of course, it's better to, to, to somehow know in advance, and that's my mission here for you, that's my message to you. And uh, that then, as I mentioned, uh, I'm really impressed by the lots of flavors in which this can be actually done. You know, and, you know, you know completion, you know, synthesis, verification, uh, all you know, bug fixing, you know, optimization, many, many usage scenarios that are probably quite close to your everyday's practice. Uh, then. That's interestingly, of course, in itself, that's yet another market. I yeah? meaning that, uh, you know, as they say, in the times of gold rush, uh, uh, it's very good to actually sell shovels. Yeah? So there's an entire market for actually developing tools of this type that I've been talking about right now. Uh, for instance, uh, Pub9, I think, is a commercial uh, you know, and, uh, undertaking, and uh, they are probably doing pretty well. Uh, another you know, take-home message I would definitely like to send to you is that uh, this all, these all developments will definitely invite more and more end users uh, to that acti active participations in the programming, like in Flashfill, or generating, you know, uh, SQL, you know, queries just from natural language and similar scenarios. Of course, this is not to say that there are not certain, there are not certain challenges that still remain. So definitely, we have many computational complexity challenges, uh, and and still that thing, you know, that issue of capturing user inter users' intent is is something to think about because it's still very difficult to to make it in a way that, on one hand, is convenient for humans, on the other hand, is uh, can lead to a correct answer of the system. So uh, to conclude, I would say I would somehow continue on this uh, quote I gave a few slides ago, that software ate the world. Uh, you may have heard that uh, another uh, quote is being popularized you know, in recent years, uh, actually uttered by Tari Singh, that AI is eating software. Um, but which he means that actually he probably means mostly machine learning is eating software because more and more you know, of software pieces that we, we would normally write manually are now being replaced by uh, by actually something that is produced or trained with neural nets, decision trees, random forests, and so on and so forth. I would try to complement on that, and actually I would say that probably AI is likely to eat the software for making so software as well. Yeah? And with this remark, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Um, uh, we thank you very much for the very, this, this very insightful presentation. We obviously have uh, a small gift from the organizer. It's a board game about Poznan. Uh, so, so if you thank you very much, and I think we have time to pick uh, one or two questions, if uh, if there are any. That's, that's good because if if you didn't have one, I will have one. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to touch about the intent. Uh, so let's say that we create a description, but this description isn't like a strict enough. 
so are there ways to well, fix something like a, the program? Let's say the program is doing that what we wanted it to do, but also is printing some random numbers mm -hmm. in the in the meantime. So how do you fix that, or just how how can we uh, alleviate that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. It's a tough one, I would say, because of course uh, the intent is a central thing here. Uh, of course, if, if, there's, if the natural language, for instance, specification is incomplete, that I, technically you cannot produce a single program uh, that can somehow meet that specification, but in a sense you can produce an incomplete program. Of course, the problem with incomplete programs is that you cannot run them, you cannot test them, but there's actually an entire branch of research, again, in program synthesis, that more formal program synthesis, where people, people were working with so-called program sketches, and there's entire technique of uh, program sketching uh, which was actually invented to address this problem of complexity I've mentioned before, meaning that we cannot actually, this doesn't scale well, you know, you know um, synthesis from program spe formal specification doesn't scale well, so rather than trying to synthesize very complex functions, we assume, they assume there in sketching, that the user would write a partial procedure with some holes, you know, empty spaces to fill in, and the synthesis system is actually only filling in with uh, you know, uh, actually those parts. So I can imagine you know, trying to answer your question that it could be in principle possible to, to devise a, a sort of approach that given natural language specification, which is incomplete, would produce a program sketch yeah, with some uh, you know, missing elements. So uh, thank you very much.